Hello, I'm Tanya Glyde, and this was the talk I gave at the Pink Therapy 9th Annual Conference on Queer Desire. I'm a counsellor and psychotherapist in private practice, and last year I did some research about queer menopause, where gender, sexuality, and age collide. My research was actually, how can therapists best support and validate their queer men menopausal clients? So my focus there was on experiences in counselling and experiences in the healthcare system. But as you can imagine, quite a lot of sex related material came up. And so I'm weaving some of my findings into this talk. Before we start, let's check in with ourselves about any ageism and internalized ageism we're holding, because we all have some of that in us, whether we realize it or not. And whatever you're bringing, notice any assumptions you may hold about age and aging bodies and sex. So in 2019, I did some research around how therapists can best support and validate their queer menopausal clients. I did this piece of work because of the near absence of research around this subject. The queer experience of menopause is not quite erased, but almost. There are some studies of lesbians in the last 30 years, which is good, but really not very many. I interviewed 12 queer identified people, nine from the UK, one, from, one each from Australia, the US and Belgium. And just here is some detail about the various people. So coming to definitions, um, all definitions can be unpacked and critiqued, but they are what I'm using today. So queer, Anyone LGBTQ identified, same sex relationships and or disruption of gender norms and or rejection of binaries. So hence the word queering. Um, LGBTQ today stands in for variations of the longer acronym. And it's important to say now that while all bodies may experience some kind of hormonal change in midlife, here I'm focusing mainly, although not entirely, on the experience of people who are born with functioning ovaries. So, what is menopause? Menopause is a hormonal transition. The ovaries production of estrogen fluctuates and then stops, heralding the end of menstruation and the end of fertility. This is a long life phase, and it's really, really important to know that. All its phases added together, it's a long phase. The phase before menstruation has completely stopped is called perimenopause. This phase can last 10 years or more, so it can easily start in your 30s. In fact, if you're in your 20s and 30s now, you need to just start thinking about this. If you're able to, ask your biological mother about her experience because it's fairly heritable. You may have been told frequently that menstruation stops at 50, but in reality, it can be earlier. And of course, much earlier if the person's ovaries are removed. And of course, it can also be later. Natural menopause has officially occurred when menstruation has stopped for a year. A person is then said to be postmenopausal. Now I made this graphic, um, it's age along the bottom and the numbers up the side are arbitrary. I just wanted to make a scale. So the gray triangle is a sort of common assumption about menopause by people who know a bit about it. Really that triangle should be smaller. The red area is the worst case scenario. Now, I know that looks extreme. Most people will not reach the outer edges of that red area, but you need to know that people can have all kinds of experiences from their mid to late 30s, even up until their really quite old age. You can say, well, these are extremes. I didn't have that. That's great. But people need to know the boundaries of this, and at the moment, people aren't being told about it at all. It's important to remember also that menopause is biopsychosocial. It's multifactorial, involving the body, the mind, and society. It's also intersectional. Our class, race, and culture may influence how we respond to it. So what do we know about menopause? Generally, the answer is very little. The word tends to conjure up someone's mum or nan over the hill, a grotesque figure of fun, sweating, struggling, raging, and sexless. Information about it is highly gendered and cishet specific. And in the media, the whole thing can come across as somewhat pantomimic. So the first image I have here 
it's a photograph of many cats legs and feet uh, with two pale colored hands among them and it bears the caption when women get to a certain age they start accumulating cats this is known as the many paws and you will see this many paws joke happen everywhere it might be cats dogs but it's, it's very popular Next, we come to another kind of menopause meme. Now, this is, this is a bit more brutal. There's a bit more self-hatred and aggression towards the self and anger too about various symptoms. So this image says the seven dwarves of menopause and it shows the seven dwarves from the movie. And content note for a bit of ableist language. Um, itchy, bitchy, sweaty, sleepy, bloated, forgetful, and psycho. It's, it's, there's some brutality to this, but again, this is really quite a popular type of meme. Now, now we come to Menopause the Musical. There is, an, in fact, an actual musical about menopause. Now, I haven't seen it. It may be a rip-roaring night out. Um, this image is, I think, before or after the person holding it. Someone is looking aghast and is, is wringing out or holding a, a cloth, which they either just have or are about to wipe their chest with to wipe sweat off themselves. I think the scene then changes to some people dancing. Um, like I say, it may be loads of fun, but while I defend anyone's right to laugh at themselves, if it gets you through the day, there's something problematic about this comedic representation. To paraphrase the comedian Hannah Gadsby, in a prejudiced society, self-deprecation is a form of self-harm. And of course, contributing to this, as you can imagine, the media is really very happy to channel despair, shame, and self-disgust. And here we have yet another trope of menopause. Um, it was a picture from an article in the Metro, I think, in London. Um, what happens to your vagina and vulva as you age? And this article came out last year. And the image has a, a pink turning to blue background, um, which is bad enough. Um, so we have a bud of a flower, a beautiful pure bloom, the pure genitals of the young woman blooming outwards and then starting to rot. And then we have this black dead flower. I mean, where do we even start with unpacking how terrible this is? Um, I remember a lot of ranting about this, but clearly they didn't take any notice. Uh, maybe they did. I don't know. But that's one. This is what's on the Internet. Um, so, you know, that's a very blatant statement. Your genitals are going to rot when you're older. Um, it doesn't really make anyone feel good. And finally, of the pictures, we have some stills from the movie She. Some of you may know this movie. It's a kind of kitsch, kitsch sci-fi um, movie from the 60s. It's got Ursula Andress as a... Um, Immortal, that's it, an immortal goddess figure, excuse me if I'm remembering the plot slightly badly, falls for a human man, a mortal man, gets him to walk through the blue flame of immortality. Now for some reason she goes through the flame as well. I forget the plot. I don't know why she had to go through it again as she was already immortal. This was an error um, because as you see and here are these stills, she begins to age and she becomes an old woman, then very old, then, then a skeleton and falls to dust, liquefies or falls to dust on the floor. I remember that scene as a child. Um, a number of people writing about their experience of menopause have named this scene, have, have referenced the movie She. So again, it shows the strong feelings people sometimes have about their bodies. Now, it's important to say that the majority of menopause research data refers to white Western cis women's experience. There have been studies of other cultures globally, and there are also studies that focus on class and race, but much more needs to be done. So that's just something to bear in mind when doing all reading about menopause. Now, I've just got two pages of references here um, from what I've been talking about. Some of them came from my study, some of the things I've just found. Um, so they may be of interest to read. So what happens in menopause? Now, in the years leading up to period stopping and for some years after, what might people in menopause actually experience? And I've grouped them just so it fits on the slide, um, but I will also read them out because it's just worth hearing. There's a might, a possibly, maybe a little bit, maybe a lot, maybe lots of these, maybe a few of them, but the point is you need to hear them. 
hot flushes, sweating and night sweats, insomnia, mood swings, depression, anxiety. If you're still having periods, then becoming extremely irregular and unpredictable, and also possibly extremely heavy breathing, heavy bleeding, um, which can keep someone confined to their house or even to the bathroom. Uh, irritability and rage, memory loss, trouble with word finding, hair loss, unusual hair growth, weight gain, chronic pain, tingling hands and feet, eczema, itching and skin dryness, and in the longer term, osteoporosis or brittle bones, stroke and heart disease. And then we have vaginal atrophy. And this is the thinning and drying of the vaginal and other surrounding tissue, making any penetration painful or impossible. The pain can reach a point where someone's in such a bad state they can't sit down, and even drying themselves with a towel can split the skin. Bladder infections can become more frequent and the likelihood of stress incontinence increases. It can also cause increased odor as the vagina becomes more alkaline and bacterial vaginosis becomes more prevalent. Then you have lowered libido or none where there was libido previously. And of course, any of these symptoms or a combination of them could have a very bad effect on someone's mental health and sexual self-confidence. They may also bring a lot of shame. There is of course a huge variation in experience, ranging from someone's periods just stopping to life-changing mental and physical breakdown. Of course, most people are somewhere in the middle. Of course they are, but it's just important to name this because until we understand the boundaries of this and what it can do, we're not doing anyone any favors around education. And, and the main thing here is many people have never been told about any of this. And people often think they're becoming mentally ill or have life-threatening illnesses, especially in perimenopause, so when they're still having periods. I've often wondered if you could call this estrogen deficiency syndrome and perhaps it might get more respect. Um, there is research on this happening and certainly the, the cognitive issues that can come with menopause have been called a mini dementia. I haven't put links up because there are so many different ones and rebuttals of this and explorations of that. This is a subject that is being explored more, so it's worth keeping an eye on. Now perimenopause, before the period stop, may magnify existing medical conditions such as depression, anxiety, ADHD, bipolar, PTSD, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Now, I need to balance that by saying that, of course, some health conditions may go away, such obviously as menstrual issues and sometimes things like endometriosis. There's a may and a might there for that second one. So again, worth looking up. It, it isn't all bad in terms of what happens to the body. Now, given everything I've just said, you, and given the number of people that can potentially uh, experience these things, you would think there was masses of support and information. This is not true. The National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, or NICE, who you've probably heard of, created some guidelines in 2015 um, to help doctors in how they would treat menopause patients. Um, this clearly has not reached enough practitioners. Now, I'll just say, I, I've just cut and pasted the information and advice page and I've, I've, these are my bolds here. I've bolded these expressions, give information, explain, give information, types of treatment, give information, give information. Uh, no, for many women and anyone in menopause, this isn't happening. Some doctors, I'm going to say hashtag not all doctors because I've seen some lovely ones in recent years and plainly some people are getting the support they need. Um, too many patients are still being patted on the head, gaslighted and lied to. And I'm sorry to say that in the more distant past, that's also what I've experienced. Um, trying to get a basic hormone test can be a nightmare. Now, to be fair about hormone tests, they are that hormones fluctuate for all sorts of reasons and they're basically a snap snapshot on the day, but they are better than nothing. And sadly, even if you do get one, you may be fobbed off with the dreaded phrase within the normal range, and this may have no bearing on the symptoms you're experiencing. Now, just a note on hormones. Hormones are chemical messengers produced by endocrine glands. The main ones relevant to this talk today are estrogen, testosterone, or T, and progesterone. Now, before we go any further, hormones are not 
gendered. I've just devoted this whole slide to saying that. Clearly, I, I, I don't know enough to say about what genetic anomalies may be out there in terms of rarity, but generally, all bodies need estrogen, testosterone, and progesterone in them to function. Several of my participants in my study hadn't been aware of this. If you're transmasculine, a bit of extra estrogen will not feminize you. If you are cis-feminine, a bit of tea won't masculinize you. People are missing out on treatment that would help them through fear and lack of knowledge. For example, some trans and non-binary people on tea who are in or post-menopause may experience estrogen deficiency without realizing. And one clue could be experiencing the vaginal symptoms that I just mentioned earlier. So what's the treatment for menopause, if you wish to speak of it in those terms? There's HRT, or hormone replacement therapy, either estrogen on its own, if you've had your womb removed, or, or a mixture of estrogen and progesterone, or taken separately if you're, depending on if you're before or after period stopping. It generally comes in pills or patches. There's also estrogen creams that can help with the vaginal issues. Now, HRT is contentious and medically may not be for everyone. It was a very large scale study in 2002, um, which scared a lot of people because of the negative health, health outcomes. Now, there, all, there are still many debates going over whether a slightly higher risk of breast cancer and other conditions is worth taking to avoid crumbling bones, strokes and heart disease. And of course, though, not all people wish to have this phase of their life medicalized. Now, a certain iteration of feminism will say that supplementary estrogen is an agent of docility, of patriarchy, and all in the cause of remaining attractive to men. I find that really reductive and erasing of the very real struggles some people are having. And to, 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 to turn to today's theme, many, 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 let me start that again. To turn to today's theme, many menopausal people desperately want their libido back. Taking testosterone can help, although there are health issues with that too. In the UK, tea is not officially licensed for cis women on the NHS. Every GP may give a different response and patients may have to push to be referred to a special NHS menopause clinic or a private clinic. But just to emphasize, if you didn't know, there are special NHS menopause clinics that you can be referred to um, if you don't have the funds to go private. Now, queers, I find, are generally more chilled about the idea of taking hormones. One of my participants used the expression hormonal hacks about their friends buying them online to make affirmative adjustments. However, suggesting to a middle-aged cis woman that it might be your hormones may be seen as offensive or misogynist by some people, so there's obviously to take care there if you're a therapist. So now I come to the LGBTQ experience of menopause. That was quite a long explainer I just did, but it feels really important because everyone is on a very different page over what they know. So now I'm coming to things that came up in my research. Things are bad enough for cishet women who are up against systemic ageism and misogyny. For LGBT, LGBTQ people in menopause, the situation can be even worse. It's important to remember the health disparities between cishet and LGBTQ people as they age. While physical health across the population generally gets worse over the age of 50, in the mainstream po population, mental health can improve. However, this is not necessarily the case for LGBTQ people. In the system, LGBTQ people are likely to experience a range of assumptions about how they have sex and who with. Asexuals may experience not being believed when they say they don't have sex and don't wish to. So for this group of people, menopause may be challenging as much due to the attitude of practitioners as due to the symptoms themselves, creating a barrier against accessing help and support. Now there are other barriers. The word menopause alone can invoke, invoke dysphoria in some transmasculine people because of its association with femaleness. So it would really help to find some new language here. My Belgian participant laughingly suggested the end of the brothel in my pants. The people at his gender clinic took care not to use the word menopause, but this left him missing some information about estrogen deficiency. 
From my research, LGBTQ menopausal clients had a mixed experience of counseling and psychotherapy, but where medical doctors were concerned, their experiences ranged from inadequate to actually traumatic. A number of participants experienced rudeness and insensitivity. One asked her GP if she could be menopausal, and he replied by telling her she did not need to know. Another participant's GP automatically assumed that they were straight. And those two experiences came up in a variety of ways among various participants. Now, a third participant reported that one doctor demanded to know what genitals they had. And, and another GP told the same person he didn't know what gender queer was and asked them if they were a man or a woman. So as you can see, multiple training needed, multiple information needed. One of the most striking outcomes in my research was hearing about the experience of participants who'd been coming into menopause at the same time as considering transition. On top of the struggle um, of thinking that they were too old to transition and the potential grief around that, when trying to get help with menopause, they had to perform for two separate gatekeepers. At the GP, they had to take care not to mention gender when asking for tea for menopause in case the doctor thought they were blagging it for transition and therefore would send them away. But when at the gender clinic, they felt they had to take a lot of care not to mention menopause in case the clinic thought they weren't trans enough. Now that's a whole study in itself and I really hope someone goes and does more research around that. Now remembering the biopsychosocial nature of menopause, trans feminine assumed male at birth people can also experience menopausal effects. This might be due simply to age in midlife or for example, if someone is taking exogenous estrogen and has to come off it, as for example, the withdrawals we've been seeing with the HRT shortage. Other medications such as the testosterone blocker Decapeptil can induce some menopausal type effects. And finally, again on this aspect of the biopsychosocial, a colleague wisely pointed out that middle-aged cishet women in menopause may in fact experience some misogynistic prejudices that are similar to those experienced by trans women. I'm not putting these two groups on the same level of oppression, but some forms of bigotry are similar, whether due to ageism or transphobia or both. Now, if you wish to do the labor, that argument might be useful to help persuade someone away from the early stages of transphobia. <clears throat> On the plus side, some LGBTQ folks in menopause may be likely to struggle less with the performance of femininity demanded of cishet women and less traumatized by the conventions of aging. And this certainly came across in my interviews. And again, I put some references there. So, menopause, sex, and ageism. Let's go back to that list of symptoms. You could assume that all this going on could well put somebody off sex before we even get to a lowered libido and a non-functioning vagina. <clears throat> but the overall problem here is that the mainstream response to menopause represents a huge failure of sex education. If someone's only way of having sex is penis in vagina, or PIV, then their options may become very limited in menopause, and this could have a very negative impact on their mental health, particularly if they feel their relationship depends on them making their vagina available to a penis-owning partner. Many people still have barely heard of lube, let alone used it, for example. Although lube doesn't fix everything here, I should just say. Now, this cuts across all identities. This, this that I'm gonna say is that it may be harder to feel sexual pleasure and desire when you have a negative body image. <coughs> oh, excuse me. A poorly functioning body plus anxiety, plus perhaps chronic pain, and all the outcomes from insomnia may cause someone to withdraw from sex. <coughs> and there are feedback loops here. I've just put up an image of a climate change feedback loop. Um, and it's, it just shows you that a small, a, a loop of things affecting themselves can also increase into something bigger. And in this case, I'm speaking of internalized ageism, responding to externalized ageism. Now, whatever your identity, being on the end of ageist microaggressions really doesn't help. And I have a few examples here. 
<clears throat> one, I was at the gynae department of a hospital and the young woman doctor asked me, are you still having sex? I was 45 years old. <clears throat> two, at a fetish market a few months ago, I was chatting to a stall holder, a young cis guy. I picked up a large vibrating wand that he was selling and started playing with the settings. He looked at me for a bit and then said, you do know what this is for, don't you? He then took it from me and ran it over his shoulders, saying, you can use it as a body massager too. Oh yes, I said. In fact, I have a Lelo wand at home, a large one. Oh really, he said. What other sex toys do you have at home then? My voice trailed off and I made my excuses and left. Three, of course, people of all genders and ages can be ageist, including ourselves. A friend has given me permission to share this. They were working in a woman-friendly sex shop. A woman in her 70s came in saying she wanted something for anal play. My friend assumed she was a newbie and offered her some anal beads. The woman said, oh, I've already used these, dear. I'm looking for a dildo now because I'm going to give it to my boyfriend up the bum. He's a younger man, you know. My friend realized how they had made age-based assumptions without even realizing. Moving towards a queer perspective. I don't want to make a binary here between mainstream sex and queer sex, as I don't think that helps anyone. But it's clear that the knowledge that there's more to life than PIV is still denied to a lot of people. Sadly, it's very difficult to find queer and kinky and age-based sexual narratives in counseling trainings or in education and mainstream information. We need way more detailed studies on this. For example, the changing relationship with our genitals in midlife, whether changed due to menopause or due to taking tea or to surgery. We also need studies of the intersex experience of menopause and more about queer relationships and how menopause intersects with them. There's some stuff on queer relationships and we just need more of all of this. Please, researchers, go and do this. One thing I've been reflecting on throughout this is that there can often be a higher level of mental and physical ill health and disability among LGBTQ people, actually of all ages. And what this seems to mean is that this group is likely to already have a different kind of relationship with their own bodies, deeper in a sense, and their own limitations. I, I might call this a form of queer adaptivity. And I suspect it's why menopause and what it changes can be so shocking to non-disabled cishet women. Now, I want to say something positive today. So let's reframe or at least neutralize the mainstream narrative. When your body is not working the way it used to, and if you still wish to live a sexual life, menopause and therefore aging can present an opportunity. The moment you step away from the traditional sex escalator PIV narrative, particularly regarding position-based sex and penetration-based sex and partner sex, there is potential to open up a far greater arena of sexual expression with the whole body, giving and receiving, solo or with others, with hands, mouths, anal, toys, tools, breath work, role play, power exchange, energy work, changing the order of things, changing the time we take to do them, and who with, in person and online. It takes a huge refocus for those raised on the terrible sex ed, ed we have even now, but I believe it's possible, and some people have a lot to teach about this. As part of the aging process, what menopause does is push us towards acceptance of change. So we could say that age is an agent of queerness, of creativity, as physical changes force or enable us to expand the way we express physical and other forms of intimacy. It's a chance to evolve how we relate with ourselves in our own embodiment, as well as others. However, there should be no pressure to be sexual simply to prove you can. Even if we used to be, we may wish to step back. If you weren't having the sex or relationships you really wanted before, abstinence may be a welcome relief. Society pushes us to express sexualness in very specific ways, and this includes queer society. At its worst, 
sex positivity can be very brutal, normative, and highly ableist. People need to be allowed to grieve and accept their lost libido. If they have, of course, lost it, and, and many people don't, I'll just say that, but many do. Now, I should say that the postmenopausal drop in libido, if you have one, doesn't make a menopausal person asexual. And actually, if you were never sexual before, you might welcome the camouflage of age and ageism even when people stop asking nosy questions about what you're up to. Now, there's a branch of queer study, queer theory called queer temporality. I'll just quote Jack Halberstam here. Queer uses of time and space develop in opposition to the institutions of family, heterosexuality and reproduction and queer subcultures develop as alternatives to kinship-based notions of community. Now today, my talk today has mainly been about the concrete and the practical, but this is an interesting theoretical path to go down. And there are a couple, there are several um, links I put on this page, which I've uh, referenced in my work, a couple of, actually several very useful um, pieces there. So definitely take a look at those, the peer reviewed research, or at least two of them are. Um, and of course, the men so, so from everything I say, have said, the menopausal phase of life can be transformative. There may be an in, in a narrative, an internalized ageist narrative of, am I too old to do this? But sexual evolution occurs. I mean, for example, I'll use an obvious one. In the number of middle-aged cis women who are married to men and had children who then have relationships with women. And the same can occur with gender. Now, if we were going to be essentialist about this, um, we might say, if a woman can't give birth or receive a penis in her vagina anymore, is she still a woman? That's just an angle to look at. And once the body has stopped menstruating, has it in fact rewound to the utopian Garden of Eden tabula rasa state where it was before menstruation started? And this is again a reminder that menopause is a transition. Now, this may make some people uncomfortable if, if you have born this way views. But for me, gender and sexuality aren't zero sum games, i.e. for one person to win, another must lose. For one person to claim a particular sexual or gender identity doesn't mean another person will lose theirs. Now, for the last two bits, I have some thought starters and tensions at the heart of this subject, and then I have a list of takeaways for therapists working with queer menopausal clients. So thought starters. One, devil's advocate. All this drama about menopause, isn't it all just part of aging? Can't people just get on with it? Two, if we gave children and adults proper accurate sex education, there would be a lot less heterosexuality, I suspect, and probably a lot less cisgender identity. Three, the concept of menopause feels very cishet normative, at least the way it's spoken about publicly. So to have a bad experience with menopause, also specifically in terms of giving up sex, is also normative. So perhaps something to be denied if you're wanting to keep up queer appearances. Four, there's also something in here about misogyny and weakness and how the weakness that can come with menopause may for some be seen as feminine and so something to be repudiated or denied. Five, we need more research to decentralize the whiteness and westernness of menopause research. However, this is not necessarily going to fix the challenging experiences that some in western populations or any populations are having. Six, the cognitive effects of estrogen deficiency, the memory loss and issues with word finding can be seen as a form of neurodiversity, also a form of impairment. The many other side effects can cause disability. Our society worships youth, but also insists that we can keep going until we're 80, climbing mountains, running companies and having skinny boudoir shots done. This is actually quite neoliberal because despite the aura of leisure, it's also talking about productivity. And so it comes as a heavy shock to many menopausal folks that in fact, once you're in your 50s, you may not be able to keep going the way you were before. Many people admit privately or online to being absolutely exhausted 
and wondering how on earth they're going to function. So what about optional paid menopause leave from work and lowering the retirement age? And number seven, the final one in this section, I'm well aware that I've, I've painted quite a dark picture of menopause and that may, some people may not relate to that and go, well, mine wasn't like that. Mine was okay. There was a bit of hassle. I had flushes for six months or a year and they've gone and sex is fine. In fact, I'm having better than ever sex. And that's fantastic to hear. Um, I'd like to see more research around the good menopause as well, or what you did or what happened or, or all that sort of thing. But the reason I'm saying all this and I'm saying it I'm describing so much of the challenging aspects is that people are not being given information. The lack of information and education about menopause is an absolute disgrace. It's a disgrace from top to bottom. Schools, colleges, medical trainings, doctors, healthcare people, therapists and everybody. I don't just want to label particular groups. Um, but I'm saying that everyone needs more training and acknowledgement. We also, if you're younger, need to, to wrestle with our internalized, with our ageism. And if we're older, wrestle with our internalized ageism. So this problem is systemic. I don't want to lay it, on, to, at, the, lay it at the feet of any individual or even group of individuals. There are plainly lots of people doing great education, but until everyone has equal opportunities to find out exactly what's going in their body, going on in their body and how it's affecting them, I'm not going to shut up about this. So that's just part seven. And as I've said, uh, cisgender heterosexual women trying to get help with menopause are, are up against systemic ageism and misogyny. LGBTQ people are up against a whole other layer. Ace phobia, homophobia, transphobia, um, and misogyny where applicable. So, And the final section, takeaways for therapists working with queer menopausal clients. Neither you nor your client are likely to have sufficient information about menopause. It's fine to own that for yourself or for them or whatever, just go and get some information. You as the therapist, at least be the holder of some information. Go away and work on your own feelings about menopause, ageism and ableism, because ageism is insidious and it's in all of us. But you need to find something out, whether it might happen to you personally or whether it's never going to happen to you, but you need to know about it. Mention menopause to your client. You might need to do it with care, but mention it and mention perimenopause. Even if it's like dismissed, mention it. Your queer menopausal client is likely to have experienced multiple discriminations before they get anywhere near the therapy room. Uh, that was one of the main takeaways from my study. And they themselves may also be experiencing internalized ageism and ableism, as I've mentioned before. If you feel you don't know enough about LGBTQ experience or menopause, go and get some training. This was one of the big takeaways, again, one of the biggest takeaways. Now, also training on hormones, all my participants suggested that people go and find out a bit. We end up perhaps knowing a lot about our own, but not about anyone else's if, if it's an issue for us. Hormones training is hard to find, and I personally have been seeking this, and you'll see a slide at the end of this, um, just with a call out for looking for a trans and menopause friendly doctor or endocrinologist to deliver a webinar, and yes, a paid gig. Okay, don't assume your clients wanting to grieve their past life. Many will be delighted that their periods will end or have already. Equally, don't assume there's no grieving or reflection about the end of fertility. Several of my participants felt the need to reflect on not being able to have children anymore, even if they never wanted them. Don't assume a person's giving up sex if they're in their 40s or older. Equally, don't tell your asexual clients that there's still time to meet the right person. If someone feels alienated by their changing body, they may need to welcome it back again, particularly in terms of finding new forms of genital pleasure or decentralizing the genitals, decentering. You might suggest your client may wish to try body work. This could be self-pleasure practice at home rather than necessarily working with a practitioner, which can be highly challenging for some. And obviously there's a red flag for trauma around anything to do with body work or just even self-touch. 
but obviously in this time of coronavirus, this time that I'm speaking, you know, guided self-touch or self-touch um, is the best we can do. But certainly there, there could well be practitioners that could help. The whole use it or lose it thing around vaginal atrophy is a bit binary. You might have read that in articles. Oh, well, if you don't put things in there, it's all a mess and terrible. But of course, it's not that simple. Um, but I will say that you may want to discuss vaginal dilation with your client. They may never wish to have any kind of penetration during sex or any at all, but they are very likely, if they're experiencing vaginal atrophy, um, possibly going to experience pain during medical examinations with speculums. I just put that there. You know, again, self-touch work with dilators or dildos may be helpful. Massive red flag for trauma, obviously, but I, I, I would be failing if I didn't mention this as a thing. And so we come to the end. And of course, I have to say, arousal, whoever we are, whatever's happening, arousal can still happen. The clitoris, if you wish it to, if you have one, can still work. Full body orgasms can still happen. And of course, the whole body can still be, it still is, a wonderful source of intense sensation. And of course, pleasure can still happen. But first, people of all identities need to understand what's going on in the menopausal body and why. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I will just direct you to a survey um, by the US sex educator, Heather Corinna, and I put the link here. They're writing a book about the menopause experience of those outside the mainstream cishet and or white population. It'll probably up, be up for a month or two. Um, please go to their website and, and check for updates on that, but it's certainly live at the moment and they would really appreciate uh, some, some support. And, to, to bring some good information to everybody. Um, seeking a trainer for a webinar on hormones. I've already spoken about that, but if someone would like to do this, uh, please get in touch. This was um, some discussion topics for groups. So you may wish to think about them yourselves or perhaps discuss them in your own group. So that's the end of this talk. Thank you very much for uh, being here and I hope this has been useful and I hope that this has provided some thought starters that may take you on your own researches or your own explorations about your own body or reflections about other people whether you're a therapist or whoever you are. Um, I'm Tanya Glide, you can find me at londoncentralcounseling.com, um, I'm on ResearchGate, I have Twitter at Tanya, lower, uh, Tanya underscore Glide and you can email me on tanya at londoncentralcounseling.com. So thank you very much for listening.